Buenas tardes a todas y a todos. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome all of you to this session where we will discuss in this seminary on behalf of the research group on intercultural processes in architecture, urbanism and territory. The PIAUD of the Faculty of Architecture, Urbanism and Ge Geography of the University of Concepcion. We welcome you through our social media networks, through YouTube, in our channel where we are broadcasting this and Facebook Live. To this first international seminar entitled Decolonizing Urban Territories, Processes of State Colonization and Indigenous Resistance that is being held since yesterday, today, the 23 of November and tomorrow the 24th. We have to remember that this seminary is supported by the ANIT project. We, I want to say hi and give my greetings for to the speakers that are doing all of these research works to Mauro, Janina, Diego. I don't know if I'm forgetting someone, but all of them. The invitation for this seminar was directed to uh, researchers and tra trained on their different colonial languages and that had to do with many other public policies that have this colonial background, education. This was an invitation to talk about various processes of dispossession faced today by indigenous peoples all over the world under different logics and mechanisms where they are trying to exist in their territories in this urban production and the that uh, is continuing coloniz with this colonization of territories with this goal we shared several questions inviting you to open this reflection and conversion conversion thinking about various current urban phenomena in which these processes and tensions are or observed in these rural and urban areas that are today where we can see them in that don't have a solution in this framework to end today's session we want to welcome you to this speaking table where we will see a short film along with their with its author authors which will accompany us today we wanted to have both authors of the short film but because of an emergency michelle will not be joining us so we will have the presence of haim jacobish to whom i will say hi after presenting him He is an architect specialized in urban studies and politics. His academic work focuses on colonial geographies, architecture, planning politics, social justice, and urban health. In 1999, he formulated the idea of establishing BIMCOM Planners for Planning Rights, an NGO that deals with human rights and planning in Israel. Uh, and he was its co-founder. His latest books are Israel Africa, Genealogy of Moral Geographies, published in 2015 by Routledge, uh, Rethinking Israeli Space, Periphery and Identity, published in 2011 by Routledge as well, 
and the Jewish Arab city spatial politics in a mixed community. So Haim Jacobi, thank you very much for joining this seminar. Uh, good, uh, good evening, good evening for you, I think. You are very welcome, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Carlos, and thank you very much, Matthew, for the invitation. Um, vamos a proyectar, antes de proyectar la we película, will, si te before parece. showing the film, here I had some questions that I think it's interesting to discuss with you before watching the film. I wanted you to tell me what are the origins of the film that we are going to see, uh, how does the idea comes up to carry out this project? What challenges did you have um, to develop this? I mean, actually, I'm just thinking that in a few days, staying with you, I'll speak Spanish. That's clear. So, uh, I mean, I would like to, to start with, you know, the origin of the project and how it has led us to to produce this short uh, documentary. Uh, the project itself started, Michelle and myself, we know each other for many years as, mm -hmm. as colleagues. Uh, both of us are working on Israel, Palestine, on human rights issues. And we felt in a meeting that we had uh, that you know, the issue of Gaza is very, very important. The reason why it is important is because of the tendency to see in, in Gaza, in the people who live in Gaza, either victims or they are very much demonized. I think, you know, uh, obviously in the Israeli media, but I would also uh, say that some of the international media. And we thought that it's very interesting and important to understand everyday life in Gaza. And, to, and then, you know, the project, you know, was shaped in a way that we try to focus on how the destruction of infrastructure and housing in Gaza affect the health of people in Gaza. Uh, we've started the project a few months before COVID and we were super lucky to have uh, our wonderful research uh, uh, partner in Gaza, Dr. Uh, Ziad Abu Mustafa, who also without him, we, didn't, we wouldn't be able to produce this film actually. Uh, Ziad was based in Gaza, he's still based in Gaza. And we felt that the power relation between us, you know, researchers and Ziad, who is in the field, are changing mainly because of COVID. Uh, and then, you know, one of our interesting findings was that in Gaza, there is a very extensive uh, art scene, I would say. There are many artists who are very much doing stuff, sometimes in public spaces, sometimes following, for example, one of the Israeli attacks, there was, there was uh, an artist who, who did some kind of in situ sculptures uh, in the ruins of the, of the city. Mm -hmm. uh, so we thought that it's very, very interesting and surprising, I must say, that within this very violent context, people are somehow very much attached, you know, to, mm -hmm. to, to art. I mean, it's not obvious in my, in my, in my uh, view. And then, you know, the project has splitted. Part of it focused on the issue of health. And this is, you know, the, the latest article that we published together. And then we decided that we want to make the invisible visible mm -hmm. uh, to create a situation that people can see that in Gaza, you know, there are normal people who want to live their life peacefully. They are interested in art and they also, and this is a big question, I think mainly in the framework of this seminar, whether or not artists have any kind of social and political agency in our society in general, and I think particularly in very, very extreme case such as Gaza. Okay, so I think, you know, the film is really a kind of um, a very organic development, I would say, of the work. And 
it also became an interesting way to develop conversation between us and our partners in Gaza. Uh, because working on a film is, you know, filming long shots and then editing it. What you put in, what you don't include, what you, I mean, so we had lots of discussions and I think that this film, you know, it's the first time that I'm involved in the production of a documentary. <laughs> I've never done it before, neither Michelle uh, or Ziad. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was also within the group of researchers, I think it was a very interesting experience. Ziad in Gaza, Michelle in, in Denmark, I'm in the UK, and our editor, Mariam, she was in New York part of the time. So, you know, I think this is actually a product of COVID mm -hmm. also. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you very much. I think it becomes a sort of a space of encounters, of different encounters and meetings. And of course, art becomes a, a tool of resistance. Um, getting back to the main title of the seminar, the indigenous resistance, I think art is a very uh, solid uh, and pivotal tool um, for doing that. Uh, actually, I would like to discuss about these issues after screening the uh, the film, if you like. And uh, the last question before uh, watching the film, uh, I would like to know, uh, Haim, what, uh, which are your, your feelings right now before re-watching the film? What do you think right now? Or what, what, do you, what are your expectations about re-watching the film right now? So <laughs> I think, you know, it's, I mean, I have a rule when a new book is published or a new article, I don't read it because I immediately catch all the mistakes and all the problems. Uh, but with a film, you know, I think <laughs> it's easier in the sense that, you know, the visual is very, very strong, I think, and the sound. Um, but for us bringing this film into your conference and, you know, raising the question on, you know, can we really talk about brought indigenous protests? Can we talk about decolonization in, you know, in settler colonial context? Because our argument is that Gaza, despite the fact that Israel withdrew from Gaza, Gaza is still under um, you know, a settler colonial power. Mm -hmm. And this is a very provocative, uh, I think very provocative uh, argument in the sense that for us, you know, scholars, settler colonialism, you need to have indigenous people and you need to have settlers and they are in the same territory. And then, you know, you have different dynamics. Mm -hmm. And I think the case of Gaza is interesting because there are no settlers anymore mm -hmm. in the Gaza Strip. But despite of it, and we argue that maybe because of that, the power uh, which, which Israel operates in Gaza is even stronger and the abuse of human rights is even more radical than before because mm -hmm. of the distance. So, you know, our latest article, Settler Colonialism Without Settlers, uh, really tries to bring it. And I, I thought that, you know, bringing it to this discussion and to the context of, I think, Latin America uh, is, is very moving, as I told you before we started the meeting, because I think, you know, what we can see is that the blueprint of colonial power is crucial and significant for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's very, very important, you know, and that, that, was, that is one of our uh, future plans to try and develop this kind of network of people working in settler colonial context as a way not to do a kind of comparative study because cases are different, of course, but to try and to understand the effect of colonialism, you know, on our society today. Uh, so obviously, we are not the first people who are doing it, but we are very interested in the built environment. We are very interested, you know, in infrastructure. We are very interested in the way in which communities operate, in you know, under a very massive, I would say, uh, uh, violence. So we feel that you know the relevance is significant, and you know to some extent you know I think I mean it's an open invitation of course, but that maybe it will create and maybe your conference is a platform to start this kind of I would say 
discussion on, on settler colonialism beyond the well-known cases. I think, you know, even the Scandinavian settler colonial case is less known. And I think people put aside even Latin America, at least in the literature or in the literature that I have access to. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe we have an, you know, a, a, an opportunity to try to look at the global meaning of settler colonialism these days, you know, in different places. De hecho, me parece muy interesante lo que has apuntado antes. I think it's very interesting what you said now, because it's something that we can read in your last article that you published last week, I guess. You and Michelle published an article speaking about this kind of, of illogic or dichotomy that is hard to understand of a Setter of colonialism without colonizers. And I would like to speak about this after the movie because I have taken my ideas from this. And we can say now that what is happening in Gaza is the negationism of all of this. They don't recognize this. Of course, we will go deeper into this after the film with the audience. El gran que hay en Gaza. This is the big problem that is in Gaza, the Nile. We are always speaking about things that are not. Like we are going to watch in the film. Jaime, if you would like, it, we will start watching the film. If you don't have anything else to add, just so we can have the context, we will watch this film. Please, let's hit play. And after that, we will have a debate about this documental. في البداية أطلقنا إصدارا سابقا من هذا الفيديو قبل أيام قليلة من القصف الوحشي الإسرائيلي لغزة كانت أزمة شهر أيار ناجمة عن القرار المرتقب للمحكمة العليا في إسرائيل بطرد أربعة عائلات فلسطينية في حي الشيخ جراح بالقدس الشرقية بالإضافة إلى اقتحام الشرطة الإسرائيلية للمسجد الأقصى في هذا الإصدار يصور مقطع الفيديو الخاص بنا روايات عن وحشية الانتصار والحروب المفروضة على غزة منذ شهر آب من العام 2007 حيث لا يحرم العنف الاستعماري الاستيطاني الإسرائيلي سكان غزة من المساحة الحسب بل ويحرمهم أيضا من احتمالات الوجود نظرة الفنان تلتقط الحياة من منظور ليس من السهل دائما التعبير عنه كيف تبدو الحياة في غزة في سياق المدن الصالحة للعيش أو المرغوبة من وجهة نظر الفنان تظهر شهادات فناني غزة قسوة وشدة آلية تدمير الحياة التي يمثلها الاستعمار الاستيطاني هم المستقبل الذي عادة ما يستحضر أحلامنا المتخيلة يأخذ بعدا مختلفا إذا كان المرء محصورا في أكبر سجن مفتوح في العالم we have the past here, we have the present, the present and the future. Arts, hope and the future of Gaza, May 2021. <laughs> 
الحمد لله يعني اخذت ايرادات عاليه يعني وعجبت الناس فلسطيني انا واتباها باصلي لك رابي على الزيتون والزيت اصلي نوعا ما يعني الوضع جيد في قطاع غزه بالرغم من الوضع اللي احنا بنعيشه الوضع الاقتصادي من وضع الاحتلال صار الحمد لله يعني عايشين وبنوكل الامر دائما الحمد لله طبعا شيء كثير حلو انه انا اكون لاجئ من خيم الشاطئ انه اغني لفلسطين بالرغم من الصعوبات اللي انا بمر فيها والشعب كله اللي بمر فيها يعني من حصار من احتلال خاصه في المخيمات عندنا الوضع كمان اصعب كمان ناحيه يعني الوضع الاقتصادي خلينا نحكي والوضع كمان السكني كمان ضيق صحيح اه صحيح صحيح اه وبالرغم من هذه الصعوبات يعني بنحب يعني احنا انه نظهر اكثر ونقدم اشياء جميله بالنسبة للبحر هو بالنسبة لي المنفس الوحيد يعني في غزة وأكثر مكان أنا بحبه وبروح له دائما يعني خاصة في الصيف يعني بنروح رحل طشات مع الأهل يعني وأكثر يعني مكان بدخل قلبي يعني أنا في قطاع غزة ولكن أنت بتعرف يعني الحصار يعني ما فيش سفن إنه احنا نطلع أو حتى يعني نروح مثلا نتخطى مثلا الحدود مثلا بسبب الحصار أنا أنا شاركت بست برامج تقريبا قبل أربع سنين وأنا بعمر 13 سنة وكان عندي معيق بالنسبة لل... للاحتلال إنه ما بقدر أطلع على أي برنامج يعني ما ما قدرت يعني انه اطلع على اي برنامج يعني بسبب الحصار والمعابر تكون مسكره دائما وما يقبلوا الدعوه انه انا اطلع على لبنان مثلا او على اي بلد ثاني انا طبعا اكثر دوله انا كنت نفسي ان ازورها بس ما قدرتش فلسطين طبعا انا بلدي انا اروح على القدس اروح على يافا عكا واي شاب فلسطيني يعني حلم انه يشوف البلدان وال والمعالم الاثريه لان فلسطين بشكل عام نوع من انواع المقاومه حكيت لك يعني احنا بنوصل رساله من خلال بنوصل رسالة تقهر الاحتلال تكون رسالة هادفة لنا انه في فلسطين وحتضل ان شاء الله حتتحرر وفي احتلال حيزول ومش حيضل ان شاء الله <تصفيق> ياسر عمر ملحن فلسطيني واعمل معلم ايضا في مدارس الام يعني انا بعتبر الفن جزء مهم من من حياه الناس في واحنا كاصحاب قضيه بنشعر انه ما زلنا نناضل اجل عداله هذه القضيه نستطيع من خلال الموسيقى هي الاداء المتاحه لنا ان نقاوم يمكن انا على صعيد الشخصي من تماما بفكرة المقاومة الشعبية أو المقاومة السلمية حتى أغنية تعبر عن ذلك بلا شك في السنوات الأخيرة يعني خلينا نحكي في 15 سنة الأخيرة الحياة في قطاع غزة صعبة جدا يعني أنا مش أحكي عن التفاصيل اللي صور كل الناس كانت عايشة لكن إحنا وصلنا لمرحلة إنه على سبيل المثال كان مش عنا بنزين وصولة بلد للسيارة فصاروا السواقين يحطوا الزيت بتبع الطهي الجلي تيمشوا العربيات بالإضافة إلى الصعوبات اليومية من قطع كهرباء من عدم دخول مواد تموينية وإلى آخره يعني فأنا بتصور الفنان مش بس أنا 
هو اللي بيبقي صامد وبيبقي واقف وبيشعر انه صاحب رسالة هاي الحياة ولازم يستمر بلا شك لازم يتوقف حياة هذا بدل على انه احنا قطعة الكهرباء واحنا بنصور هذا جزء من حياتنا بلا شك فتح صندوق الجوال كثير هاي بنعيشها هاي المعاناة لازم نضل صامدين ولازم نضل واقفين ولازم الله اعلم يعني ممكن الشعوب في باقي العالم في اوروبا لما صار في حجر بيتي لمدة أسبوعين ثلاثة أنا شفت بعض المناظر من إيطاليا صاروا بعض العازفين والفنانين بيعزفوا من على شرفات المنازل وكان شيء جميل بس شعرت قديش الضيق والكآبة اللي أصابتهم لمجرد حجر أسبوعين أو شهر في البيت إحنا كفلسطينيين أنا محجور في قطاع غزة من آخر مرة سافرت في 2005 يعني 15 سنة كمان أسرانا اللي محبوسين لدى الاحتلال عشرات السنوات في عنا أسرة 39 سنة 39 سنة في زنزانة صورت أجد الكهرباء فليقطعوا الكهرباء كما شاء ف... يمكن الناس حسوا فينا يعني يمكن الناس قالوا احنا يا جماعة احنا زهقنا من الحجر شهر في ناس فلسطينية محبوسين صار لهم اربع عقود صور اربعين سنة محجور في مكان واحد بنحاول نفكر يعني انا غنيت قبل شوي اغنية عن ما زلت هنا وصلت هاي بتعبر عن حالي الاصلي اهم شيء اهم شيء في كل الموضوع هذا انا اتمنى هاي الرسالة تطلع برا وتصل للعالم هتافة شعب لمن يصعدون الى حتفهم باسمين إلهام الأسطل 28 عام درست فنون جميلة في جامعة الأقصى بكالوريوس بالنسبة لنظرتي أنا كفنانة للحياة في قطاع غزة نظرة سلبية سلبيات أكثر من ناحية معنوية من ناحية معنوية إنه فيش فيش إن هو النفس إنه الواحد يرسم من ناحية مادية إنه الأشياء غلية صار زاد الأشياء استغلال بعض أو مش مش البعض للمناطق هذه اكيد لو احنا فتنا حنعرف نعكس الصوره اللي جاي لها العالم احنا فعليا ممنوعين بشكل تام موضوع كورونا اثر علينا بشكل سلبي وبشكل نفسي وازمه كورونا منعتنا من المشاركه في الاجتماعات محليه وخارجيه محليه لانه ما تجمعات ممنوع الاشياء الفرص اللي كنا احنا نلجا لها او التقاء الفنانين او التجمعات الفنيه تقريبا كلها توقفت بشكل عام فهذا سبب في في Basically, it comes to a complete stop تشويش أو تشويه القضية الفلسطينية بجعلها فقط في الأشياء الأساسية أو الأكل أو الطعام أو السفر وغابت عن عن بالنا اللي هي الأمور القدس والقضية والأسرة والأمور هذه كلها غابت عن بالنا يعني تقريبا إحنا تغيبنا صرنا فقط نفكر كيف إحنا بدنا نعيش مش كيف إحنا بدنا يصير عنا دولة أو كيف إحنا بدنا يصير عنا حرية 
disassociated and only focus on how to survive day to day and not on how we can have a country and freedom. شوف يعني الفن بيلعب دور مهم ومعبر هو عاكس الصورة الحياة اليومية بس بشكل مختلف الفنان الفلسطيني خصوصا دائما بيكون بمواضيع مختلفة أنا شخصيا صاحب رؤية إنه زي ما في غزة الصورة لغزة بالإعلام I have the view that although there is the image of Gaza through media outlets as a word torn place of destruction and peace, I personally see that there is a different and renewable image of life in Gaza. This different image of life in which people don't often see. They usually are not visually. They are not visually used to gather the place in which love is uh, 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 to do. Street walls cover the messages of love is a representative uh, uh, example. Uh, uh, Although these inscriptions uh, might not appear visually uh, 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 pleasing, uh, uh, they reflect uh, how people are uh, able to continue uh, living uh, uh, and emulating hope. Perhaps now I would like to explain it is difficult to lose hope in Gaza because there are so many people who are actively in peaceful art, if you display your work in a gallery, then you are targeting a specific audience. However, if you go out and create a mural history, then you are targeting a specific audience. This video is an interactive experience with people who are feeling like they 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 are بتغير المحيط كله لما يصحى واحد يلاقي قدام بيته عمل فني كبير في متر في حروف لونها بينك لون العمل زي البيوت برونز اشي بشد الواحد شد هذا بيخليه يفتح اليوم تبعه بشكل سعيد جميل This makes them start the day in a joyful and beautiful way الحصار هو واحد من الاشياء اللي كانت قص أشد قسوة في بداية الحصار كان في عنا مشاكل العلاقة بالأدوات المستخدمة إنه الإسرائيليين منعوا إدخال زي الألوان والقماش وما كانش متوفرة حتى لو توفرت كمان القدرة الشرائية لإلها مش موجودة لأن الفنان موضوع كتير صعب وبالتالي صار الفنان يبحث عن بدائل والبدائل كانت سيئة جدا يعني مش كمان جودة يعني الوان بجودة سيئة لا الوان ما لهاش علاقة بالجودة خالص فهذا أثر على الانتاج بس رغم كلها صاروا الفنانين حتى بهذه المواد والأدوات السيئة يستخدموها لأنه ما فيش عندهم خيارات بالذات في السنوات الأولى من الحصار بس كمان بنفس الوقت احنا سنة حاطين كفنانين قدامنا ظلنا كيف بدنا مع بداية انتشار منصات التواصل الاجتماعي والتفاعل كان لازم نتعلم ادوات معاصره يعني اليوم احنا بنحكي بلغه العصر زمان الكورونا عم نحكي عن حاجه على لغه الديجيتال احنا بلشنا في هذا المفهوم بعد من 10 سنوات صارت اه لانه هذا هو الخيال اللي كان قدامنا انه انت مش قادر تطلع لوحدك برا غزه شو بدك تطلع؟ بدك تطلع اما صوره اللوحه او بدك تطلع صوره فيديوغرافيه او بدك تعمل فيديو ارت او بدك تعمل اداء وتطلعه كمنتج بصري رقمي شوف الفنان هو دائما وجوده اول شيء بالبلد هو صمود وبالتالي هذا الوجود هو بيساعد الناس على البقاء في داخل المدينه وجودك في ظل الحصار قصدك بالضبط اه لانه انت يعني عندك خيارات انك انت ممكن تطلع وتهاجر بس انت وجودك واصرارك على البقاء واستمرارك بانتاج رغم كل الظروف الحاكمه هذا بحد ذاته هو صمود وهذا ببعث الامل بشكل مباشر وغير مباشر للناس انه والله هذا الفنان اللي هو مش بيلاقي شيء يعاد وبيشتغل وبيعمل فن وبالتالي بصير انت مثلا كثير من الشباب وكثير من اقران جيلك اصرارك في وجودك وبقائك في مدينتك
له معنيين معنى هو قديش انت عندك قدره على الصمود وبس الامل للناس الاخرين عشان يصمدوا زيك والشيء الثاني انه انت صعب تتخلى عن صعب تتخلى عن المفاهيم بالتالي الفنان هو بصموده بالمكان بيبحث او بيعطي الناس الامل او الناس يفكروا بعملية الصمود والبقاء في المدينة الآدمية هي ما تجعل البشر ما هم عليه الحرية هي مثال على جانب من جوانب الإنسانية التي تساهم في كيفية نمو الناس كبشر مستقبل مدينة غزة هو السعي لإضفاء الطابع الإنساني على سكانها إن التمثيلات المعتادة للمكان أو المدينة كموقع للدمار يتم نقشها هنا عبر الصور المرئية والقصص الفنية للحب والأمل والإيمان على الجدران حول مدن غزة ومن خلال التعبيرات الفنية ما زلت هنا وسط الزنزانة خلف الحقان أغني ما زلت هنا وسط الزنزانة خلف القضبان أغني لفيكتور جارا للشيخ إمام أغني جيفارا جيفارا Thank you so much, Matthew, for showing us the film. I remember you all, remind you all that now you can start sending your questions through our channels that are available for the broadcasting through YouTube and Facebook Live. Um, they will gather the questions and comments so we can present them here so we can start speaking about one of the authors of the film, Jaime Jacobi. Jaime, before presenting the discussions or suggesting some of these topics, I had prepared before rewatching the film. Many times I wanted to ask you how you have felt now after rewatching it right now what has gone through your mind um I, what came to my mind is really the global meaning i would say of the experience of people in gaza uh you know it's interesting because of the language my i mean i speak arabic but not good enough you know to follow the whole conversation mm -hmm. i can read spanish subtitles and understanding part of the words. And, you know, this kind of, it, it's, it's interesting because some of the words that came over and over again in Arabic were love and hope. Uh, I think at the end also Muhammad Shkade, uh, who also, put, you know, this is his voice at the beginning and at the end of the, uh, of the film, who is, uh, I think the best Palestinian journalist and analyst I know. Uh, so, he also mentioned this word love and 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 and, and hope mm -hmm. and i think there is there is a very very global message here and the other thing that came very again in a very moving manner i would say is you know the very humanizing presence of the interviewees uh all of them except of the first one the musician the young musician who who, who chose to be filmed, I mean, that was his choice, to be filmed, you know, in front of the, of the sea, of the Mediterranean. Uh, all, the, all the others, and we have a few others, really picked their personal space. And I think that the background was very, very telling, I would say. Uh, first of all, even the choice to, you know, this, the Sea of Gaza is, I would say, almost mythical from political point of view, as maybe the only way that one could escape. But even the sea is highly controlled these days by Israel. Uh, so, you know, 
the sea became, or you know, the beaches of Gaza of the Strip became, on the one hand, a space to escape, mm-hmm. from, you know, from violence and so on and so forth. On the other hand, uh, I think there is a clear idea that they are also highly controlled. Uh, mm-hmm. I think you know the other musician. Uh, I guess that for most of the people, they couldn't recognize Mahmoud Darwish, who is a Palestinian poet. Uh, his profile was painted, you know. So there is something very, very telling, I think, in this kind of uh, visual representation that people, you know, pick in order to feel comfortable during the interview. So I felt that suddenly the visuals, the background all the time, came very, very strongly. And I think somehow it complements what we were trying to do, I think, is really to humanize the people. And so, yeah, this is my thought. Sí, de hecho, estoy de acuerdo con esa lectura yeah, que me parece. Yeah, I agree with your reading that it was that it's more deep than watching any other documental of any other media outlet that are always showing always showing violence. It is more dramatic to see these like love expressions, hope expressions, how you say this peaceful messages that is repeating through their testimonies of the four of them that's way more human and real and it's more dramatic and i think also that is very interesting speaking about the sea because i had it um graded written down because it's a paradox. The Mediterranean has been the sea of communication, of touching, of links and relationships that are being now broken because of these logics, closed uh, logics of borders, the Frontex agency adopted by the European Union that was um, that has been years creating uh, refugee sites to say so for the people that are trying to reach the European um, region and they stop them from being something else beyond their territories of violence. We can start if you would like after this first impression we can say that what shocked me the most and that and that I think that is floating around the film and in your last article that you published with Michelle is the topic of prohibition of being for them. There is no future there because there are no conditions to even have a present where they can live. So you have this paradox that we were talking previously of this settler colonialism without colonizers, taking now the possibility of living there. The first testimony says of the off boys in the film say that they are confined in the biggest open space prison, which comes to rectify this a prison kind of space without being a prison. This is Palestinian territory is a prison without being one. How you said the, the sea always represents the outside, traveling, communicating. Then it becomes a meaningless thing. And it's almost ridiculous because it's like a wall. It's the limit of the prison that they are in. Now you take away this meaning of the sea of linking people and unifying people. That that shocked me. This There is no possibility of being, no ontological possibility of thinking about that territory of to be. 
Yeah, I, I totally agree with you, uh, Carlos. Um, and I would like, you know, I think, you know, one of the things that we are very interested in, and I think it's very important that you, you, you've you also mentioned, is the notion of the future. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that thinking about the future is something that is kept only to privileged people. Um, and I think, you know, as human beings, for us, thinking about the future is almost natural, you know? We wake up in the morning and we think, okay, what are we going to have for lunch? Or what are we going to do in the evening? Or what are we going to do, you know, during Christmas break? Mm -hmm. And how our city will look like, how our community will look like. And what we we, we, we have witnessed in, in Gaza, and this is, you know, a hard data, I would say, is, you know, that the young generation people from the age, let's say 17, 18, to the age of 25, 30, they are completely <clears throat> traumatized. So for example, some of our interviewees discuss the issue of they cannot get married. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you know they don't have the economic means to support a family. Yeah. Now, in a relatively traditional society, this is a big issue for both men and women. Another striking uh, finding is the very high and growing number of young people who are trying to commit suicide. I'm talking about hundreds of attempts to, you know, of suicide. And you know, the whole uh, mental health dimension in Gaza is a whole issue that you know, I, I, we will not be able to discuss today, but this is a very serious issue. Mm -hmm. And when you discuss it with people, and last week uh, or two weeks ago, we were lucky to have a meeting with uh, a psychiatrist in Gaza. Uh, so again, the notion of the future mm -hmm. is, is really an issue there. And mm -hmm. I think it is very also nicely linked to, to, to the notion of the, you know, of the territorial space of the sea, of the Mediterranean. And for me, uh, like um, two months ago, I visited my mom in Israel and I went to the beach in the south of Israel. Mm -hmm. And you know, then suddenly I saw how close Gaza is. I could see Gaza from Israel. I mean, in a normal situation, I could walk and meet the interviewees that we, we just watched today. So blocking the horizon of the future of hope I think this is the real damage. I would say, first of all, to the people in Gaza, but you know, if we look at the whole region, I think it somehow damages also the Israeli public, not thinking about you know, a common future in this territory. De hecho, I... In fact, there are testimonies that are very shocking that are very difficult to process like the first one the young singer that said that the country that he would like to visit is palestine he isn't able to be there he is from there and he cannot visit it he's prohibited from going there and they take away this social interaction cultural interaction daily life interaction from this fact of thinking of marrying and things that are so like normal for us i don't know going to eat out to some place there are things those are things that are, are not part of their lives matthew i see that he has a question Maybe, Matthew, you can ask it to yourself. Any comments? I will do it in Spanish, so the interpreters can do it, the interpretation. There is some similarity of the internal colonialism more than settler colonialism. Between Gaza and Chile, la presencia militar, la importancia the military del presence, the importance of the state, and 
por and ejemplo, the en el trabajo example, que vimos acá en, en el, el, el seminario, eres in, Zafadia, uh, that we saw in the seminary. no sé si se pronuncia así, en la, todo eso en la colonización. In eh, a place podríamos hablar de un colonialismo estatal colonialism. en casa, so can we como en el título a, de, de este seminario, Procesos de Colonización Estatal. Like similar to the title of this seminary, could we be speaking about a state colonialism, maybe in Gaza? I just want to be sure that I understand. Can we speak about state colonialism? Mm. You know, it's. Uh, I think, I mean, I think that first of all, understanding the. I think you know we know that historically there is a difference between colonial project and settler colonial project. The, I think the differences are not very, always very clear and sharp, but I think that what we see in the space of Israel-Palestine is, you know, an ongoing process of, you know, colonial, you know, colonialism, i.e., uh, you know, appropriation of land, building, extensive building of settlements, and so on and so forth. Be, I mean, especially this, you know, in the last few decades beyond the green line. But to my view, what is more interesting is to look at the two uh, extremes, Israel within the green line and how settler colonialism operates there, i.e. excluding uh, Israeli Arabs, i.e. Palestinians with Israeli citizenship, who are formerly citizens, but in fact, you know, they are not equal. And the state is using, I would argue, mainly planning mechanisms in order to control this population. And the other extreme case is the Gaza case, where apparently you don't have settlers. And I think that what we can see in both cases, and this is you know, a kind of argument that you know, uh, I think you know, needs to be explored in more detail, is how the notion of slow violence, a term that we use in our article, uh, and we, you know, we, we, we refer to the work of Rob Nixon, because we think that you, know, you have the big violence events, war, bombs, airplanes, but th this is, you know, it's very performative. And I think as Carlos said, this is what you watch in the news, okay? And we feel that there is a slow violence, process of slow violence, which is linked, for example, in the Gaza case, to the herbicide, you know, to the destruction of the agricultural infrastructure, mm -hmm. not just pipes and water, but also the land itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, slow violence is also, you know, has to do with the way in which Israel controls uh, the import of medical uh, equipment to Gaza or construction materials to Gaza with the argument that it is used you know, by the Hamas uh, and so on and so forth. While in Israel within the Green Line, which is you know, part of the status quo, and you know, I grew up all my life in Israel and you know, uh, it's not that I don't think that Israel has the right to exist, just the opposite. I think if we want Israel to exist, we need to understand that we need to change the social and political hierarchies within settler colonialism. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, to you know to have the same development and planning rights for Jews and Arabs in Israel. You know, it sounds very basic, but I guess that also this is something which has some similarities. I assume to to you know to other cases in you know in in, in Latin America, for example. What is the land regime, or how do you use the law and the planning regulations in order to grab more land from indigenous people or to limit their expansion? So I think I think that the notion of slow violence and you know, okay, Rob Nixon is talking about is talking about uh, uh, slow violence in a different context. He's talking about you know the way in which slow violence affects the environment and hence it affects communities. And I think what we are trying to do is to bring the notion of slow violence to, to the discussion, because it's very easy 
you know, to support the people in Gaza after, you know, uh, you know a specific uh, uh, event, which is tragic, which is awful, which is terrible. But what we feel is that we need to develop, to reply to slow violence and to try to see what is the meaning of violence, you know, the temporal meaning of violence along, you know, several decades. So the notion of hope, the notion of future, which are missing or, you know, which are shrinking, I would say, in Gaza is something that should concern us all on a global level. Because I think, again, it indicates how power relationships, which are historically produced, how they are still very relevant to understand, you know, life of people, in our case in Gaza, but I would say in other places also. Gracias, Matthew. Gracias, Jaime. De hecho, ahí hay un tema eh, respecto a la violencia. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Jaime. In fact, there is a topic about violence that takes me to Judith Butler, that she has been working since uh, what happened with the, in New York in first, oh, sorry, the 11th September. So she is working from her perspective as a Jewish, white, American woman and her relation with the state of Israel. She has been thinking for 20 years how to respond to violence with nonviolence. That's one of the biggest challenges, one of the hardest challenges that we can see in anywhere in the world. Now we are seeing it in Chile and it's also present in this documentary, how to respond in a non-violent way to a word that is very violent. Even it's like terror from the state, if you allow me the expression. So it's something very complicated. I don't know what you think about this, Heim. I think, you know, uh... I totally agree with the term state violence. I think states have the privilege to use violence without any justification. Mm -hmm. In some, you know, some places in the world, I mean, I would say United States, I would say Israel, I would say, you know, uh, you know, you know, the case of Latin America better than me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this a situation that the state uses power is always used in a way that you know is based on on politics of fear it is i mean it could be against migrants it could be against indigenous people uh but you know creating a sense of fear and responding in a violent way the state doesn't need to to justify to anyone and i think the accumulation of political powers through these actions of, of violence is very, very eff effective, you know. I think it's a global phenomena, or almost a, a global phenomena, that, you know, people say, okay, you know, there's this danger, uh, this is the response. You see, everything is fine now. You know, we are not, in our case, we are not in Gaza anymore. We can bomb Gaza with airplanes. Uh, it's there, it's far away. We don't see it, we don't hear it. And I think that this is, you know, uh, a very dangerous process because it infiltrates into different spheres. Because this is also the way that, you know, in Europe, that's how different states refer to migrants from the Middle East or from from Africa. So I think this is this is a very I think this is a very crucial issue that you are raising. You know that state violence is is obvious. It's unquestionable. Uh, and, it, and, and we all know how it accumulates power, political power, uh, at least, you know, within this kind of uh, more, uh, uh, I would say, mainstream right wing uh, parties, I would say almost everywhere. So I think, you know, the, the question of violence is very, very important. And I think it's very difficult to reverse it. Uh, you know, it's easy to mention Franz Fanon in this context. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and the way in which you know the only way for to decolonize hmm. is through violence whether or not I agree with it I don't think that I agree with it you know it contradicts I think it's not just contradicts my ideology it also contradicts my psychology I would hmm. say mm-hmm. uh, but we know that within the decolonizing literature, I mean, there is this, you know, there, there are enough people who say, you know, at the end of, you know, of the day, violence will reverse power relations. I don't buy it. I think that we, in the world that we live today, that privileged people, white people, settlers, you'll name it, have power and have or have more privilege than indigenous people or black people, I think that we should understand that at the end of the day, it really harm our life as privileged people, not just morally, I would say also in everyday life. And I think by the way, that COVID is a good example uh, to observe it, you know, Mm -hmm. Uh, the fact that in cities where you have high inequality, big differences between groups, who are class, ethnic, and racial groups. Mm-hmm. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, the virus doesn't, does not differentiate between poor and rich, black and white. It's true that if you are black and poor, you have a better chance to die. Mm-hmm. But I think that what, what I'm trying to say is that we need to understand that we are all living in the same ecosystem, uh, especially within cities. I think this is a very urban question that, that you're raising. So for me, the issue of violence is, uh, or, you know, I think, you know, there are enough ways in the global world we are living in to break boundaries and to bring the message, such as, for example, the guy in the film who is talking about digital art and the way in which, you know, or even this film, it couldn't happen, you know, 20, 25, 30 years ago. And suddenly, you know, we, we again, I'm, I don't think that there is a digital equality in the world. What I want to say is that we can see that we can communicate globally in different ways. And I think it is fairly effective as we all know. Uh, but I don't want to be naive. I mean, I know that it could sound as a kind of naivety. Uh, and I think that the question that we need, our, uh, we need to ask ourselves your head how? but the other one did I. how how exactly how exactly we can really mobilize people in cities these days or you know in different places to reverse these power relations and i think it has to do also with global solidarity for me this is a key issue gracias Jaime, porque todo esto que estabas mencionando me lleva a... Thank you very much, Haim, because all of this you were mentioning takes me to something else. Right now, I have many things in my in my mind. I just remember the Festival of Palestinian Art that I think is celebrated in Madrid. It needs a platform to visualize these ways of fighting and this way of tool and living that cannot be in places like Gaza. And this goes farther than the media, all these big media outlets that want us to believe. Thank you very much for also mentioning people so important that are always very uh, present in Chile, Franz Fanon, Light, and also Said, that you mentioned in your article the critical, the literary critic that is from Palestine and that had a very bad time in the U.S. precisely for defending the Palestinian struggle in the U.S. Um, we also talked about Achille Mempe yesterday, the Cameroonian philosopher, that you also quote him in your article, you talk about a term that yesterday Pablo Mancilla mentioned that I think is crucial to understand what is happening, at least in the Gaza Strip, 
and also what is happening in Frontex and the, the migration to Europe and its necropolitics. Mm. Remember to 2001, it um, took the Mike, uh, Michel Foucault consent, concept, sorry, that now cannot explain at all what is happening with things as we watch in the film. So I think now, Haim, I'm going to ask you if you want to explain a bit more about how necropolitics, necropower, if they're the ones that Membe and others talk about, preciado in some of their, of their texts, I would like to know a bit about that. Beyond concepts, terms, how it operates, really, the necropolitics, the necropowers. I think maybe a good way to, to start the discussion about it is you know, to mention one of the interviews, or I mean, it, it's a theme that came over and over again in different interviews with people in Gaza. Mm -hmm. And this is this kind of uh, limbo between life and death. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, one of the interviews, and I, I don't quote her, you know, word by word, but she says something, you know, I live in a, in a, in a void. I'm alive physically, but I know that the, the death is just is close to me. I mean, and this is something that was repeated by different, you know, living, we, we call it non-life uh, in, in our work. Uh, you are not dead, but you are, I mean, you live biologically, I would say, but again, it is linked to the notion of the future. I think, you know, you, you are alive, but it is meaningless. It is meaningless because you have no future, you have no hope, okay? And I think that uh, uh, the whole, uh, I mean, uh, there is a work of a very good colleague of mine, Nadi Rasha Luka Vorkian, who is a Palestinian uh, criminologist, mm -hmm. uh, worked a lot on, on, on that uh, topic. So I think the whole issue of the, the you know, of the dead, body which is very very central to the israeli-palestinian conflict you know uh it is an an object of exchange between israel and you know and palestinians uh it is it is something which is part of the performance on both societies when a soldier on each side is killed uh and i think it is a very it is very much rooted i would say in the, in the political, social, cultural, and visual uh, uh, spheres of both societies. Uh, I think that Israelis tend to think that, you know, it's, you know, uh, you know that there is something a bit uh, vulgar, performative in the death in the Palestinian side. While I would argue as someone who grew up in the Israeli educational system, that there is a very canonic and very central role to the dead body in Israeli society, Israeli culture. But again, I don't think, you know, I, I'm not trying to judge neither Israelis nor Palestinians. I think it's an observation. Uh, and, you know, this is something that you grow up with. And I think it does two things. First of all, it justifies your own motivation, you know, to serve your country on both sides. And I think that it is also a way to look in a kind of critical way on the other side. And I think, it, but again, I'm very much influenced by the interviewees uh, mm -hmm. that we met during our research and also in, in the film. I think that there is a certain moment that people are so, uh, so, uh, honest and so simple and so human that you know beyond the whole 
commitment to the national project, and again, it doesn't matter if it's in Israel or within Palestinians, they all, I mean, there is a certain moment that people are human beings. There are certain moments that, you know, uh, the life, you know, in a, I would say again, in a biological sense, is what they have. And I think that this is, you know, this kind of, I would say, uh, almost physiological, political understanding of life of people in conflict zone is very, very important because it helps us, I think, to humanize them. Gracias, Jaim. Um, <clears throat> vamos a Thank seguir you, Jaim. We will continue following up on this and the questions or comments that um, the audience sent. Uh, Mauro, I don't know if you have any comment. Yes. Yeah. But if you have questions there, you can say the question and then I talk. Okay, so it's a question from one of the members of this research group, Diego Benavente. He's saying that this question is very complex. <laughs> He's saying, what do we see that it's more likely to happen in Israel and Palestine? two separate states or one intercultural state where Palestinians and Israeli coexist. Before answering this question, I am also wondering if these are the right terms for the question. I don't know if these are the right words to talk about this, to talk about this conflict. What do you say, Jaime? Uh, thank you. I think it's a, <laughs> I think it's a very difficult question, and I think it's an excellent question. So thank you for asking it because I think it is very much linked to to our discussion. Um, and I, I I think you know that the whole notion of two state solution is not relevant anymore to the territory of Israel Palestine. And it's not relevant, first of all, because the project of occupation of 67 and the very massive colonization created an amazing fact on the ground. I mean, mm -hmm. if you look, and I think the work, you know, the old work of my colleague, Eyal Weizmann, uh, is, you know, is very relevant to, you know, the maps that he created. You can see that the West Bank, or the Palestinian side, it's like a Swiss cheese. You have many, many holes, uh, which are, you know, Israeli settlements. In the last 20, 25 years, the state of Israel invested lots of money in creating roads and infrastructure to connect it. And the whole idea of two states, i.e. dividing the territory, is just impossible. No one can draw a line. And I know all these guys who are kind of liberal mainstream and obviously right wing, who well, say, yeah, I can draw the line, but then you say, okay, is it Israel? Because there are so many Israeli settlers here, or is it Palestine? And what is the meaning of having two states to Israeli Arabs, Palestinians who are Israeli citizens? So I think, first of all, the, the geography of occupation is unreversible. I cannot see any political leader whatsoever who can take all the settlers, Israeli settlers, and bringing them back to the green line. It will never happen. And I also think that it's, I mean, it's impossible geographically, it's impossible demographically, and there are less and less people on both sides who still hold the idea of having two states. There is, it started, I would say 15, 20 years ago with a small group of people who were considered as radical to have a one state solution. One state solution means decolonization, <laughs> decolonization of, I would say, of land, decolonization of policies, decolonization of, of I would say, uh, 
of, of the spirit of, of the both people. And there are different models of how we can live, you know, as one state. I mean, if we, if we understand that power relations should be changed and reformed, if we believe that the rights of all people should be preserved, and if we believe that we can create, you know, a healthier society, there are solutions. And, you know, I was lucky to be part of a group of people who wrote, you know, different policy papers on how to do it from security, from governance, how to deal with Jerusalem, how to deal with the holy places. There are many, many how to do, what to do with Palestinian refugees, the right of Palestinian refugees. There are many, many questions and we try to tackle them all. I don't say that this is the ideal solution. I say that it's possible. Mm -hmm. So my concern, though you know I don't live in Israel now, but my concern is that Israel is a de facto binational state. I think you know it's very, very clear. And the question is what Israel and the Palestinians, of course, and how the world will help to do it, whether or not it's going to be a binational entity, I don't want to call it bi binational state, okay, binational entity, or is it going towards being an apartheid state? I'm afraid, and I don't say it, you know, I'm not happy to say it, I'm afraid that Israel is more going towards apartheid rather than to a solution which includes all people in this territory. Uh, and, you know, I don't want to go into the apartheid discourse now, but what, I mean, it's not exactly as we had in South Africa, but I think that in 10, 15 years, that's what we are going to see. And it goes back to the question of decolonization. What is the meaning of decolonization? Uh, is it re just reversing, you know, the situation back to 100 years ago? No. I think it has to do with understanding that power sharing is an important, is very important uh, if you want to, 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 to decolonize the space, the society where we live. Uh, I think the whole question of justice, I think the whole question of reconciliation, and I think, you know, the whole, uh, you know, uh, understanding of Israel as being part of the Middle East, because, you know, Israel, is an island. <laughs> I mean, most Israelis would say, no, we are not part of the Middle East. You know, we are sending our musicians to the Eurovision. We are part of e Europe. And this is, you know, the, the, the way in which Israel has socially and culturally constructed. It's a big problem for me. And I think, you know, unfortunately that Israel is taking more the apartheid approach rather than the binational entity approach. I hope that I answered this difficult question. If you want, you can write to me. I can send you some references. I'm happy to do it. Gracias, Jaime. Gracias, Diego, por la pregunta. Eh, Mauro, adelante, que creo que tenías. Thank querías... you very much, Jaime and Diego, for the question. Mauro, now you can go. Yes, thank you. I want to thank you, Jaime. Hello. I think that there are many layers of the things you have said and also the video that you showed to us. I have many questions to ask and I'm really happy to have heard the, the last question because what we talk with Matthew is always about property or things like that, those are our main concerns. But now I'm going to allow myself to ask you something more cultural related. With this logic that you're sharing with us, for the people that I've met from Palestine, maybe he's even watching me. <laughs> he lives in, this, um, in Jordan, lives in Jordan. And he says that I'm the Palestine who goes up from 
Palestine, but the rest of the people cannot go out, they cannot fly. And that time we talked a lot precisely because I'm also interested in understanding these internal boundaries that we see in Chile, especially with the Mapuche people. And they live in this border condition that is expressed in different ways in the territory. And we have different logics as well, these different colonial logics that were prior to this current process. So this makes sense to me because the conversations I have had with some Palestinians, we have these links between the Palestinian word and the Mapuche word as the vision they have of themselves as peoples that are being subjected for in colonization processes. Their bodies are the affected through generations. What caught my attention from the documentary is that it takes you to that place, far from the military chronic, from the news, from blood and fire, it takes you to the place where you can see why that people are still there and they still want to be Palestinian. And I think that's a very complex equation for a state that doesn't want to accept that. So this fight is permanent, but I see that is also similar is what oh. and our indigenous peoples in the continent under colonization processes i see that this is very different to read the problem because something is making you stay there something is telling you no i want i belong here i want to stay here even though we have this dark context and you were talking about suicide and you were talking about death and life with necropolitic there is a decision to say i want to exist i want to be here and that takes us to something more spiritual and what is this spiritual thing that links people palestinian people to their territory maybe that's also a question for israeli people because there is a different condition. Maybe this is a very deep and difficult question, but I think it's interesting to know how so this is reflected. The, the part that is more about life, ontological, if you want, about the Palestinian people. I, I think, you know, it's again, it's, it's a hard question that, uh, you know, I think we need some more Zoom meetings to discuss it. Um, but I would like to, to pick on something that you, you've mentioned because I think I think there is there is an important issue here. Uh, I think that you know in a critical social science school, we tend to we say okay, you know everything is constructed. You know our sense of belonging to land, our sense of belonging to our community, it is all socially constructed. Uh, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And I tend to accept it. However, at the same time, I also know how important the sense of belonging is to people. And if I'll take it to the film, I think all interviewees. I mean, it was a kind of. I don't want to sound critical. I mean, but it was obvious that they will mention their commitment to the Palestinian struggle and to the future of Palestine or to, you know, to, or in a way they, they will mention their national attachment. I think it was obvious that it will happen. And I think that, you know, even though I'm highly critical of, you know, all this kind of, uh, the way in which, you know, Zionist Israeli culture is constructed for years, I know that you know it is very meaningful to people, the issue of land, the issue of landscape, 
the issue of, uh, you know, for us architects, the whole architectural debate, I would say in Israel, 100 years back, is very much based on the obsession of what are we doing here? How can we be natives? How can we construct a new state, a new city, a new village that will be local? The whole question of being local or this kind of uh, you know, being, I would say native is, or being indigenous is very, very central, I would say, to the history of Israeli architecture in the last 100 years. I think this is one of the key themes, one of the key questions. And it very much linked to the Palestinian question uh, or the Palestinian debate on what is the, the meaning of being vernacular. You know, I have some Palestinian friends who are architects and planners. And they always, you know, I'm laughing at them, you know, I'm trying to be very cynical when we talk, you know, they always care about being vernacular, being local. I tell them, you know, you're exactly like my, my Israeli architects friends. So it, on the one hand, you know, it's, we, we can make fun of it, but I think it just indicates how important it is and how we cannot say, you know, okay, we are social sciences, scientists, or, you know, we are intellectual, we know that it is all constructed, people forget about it. I think that if we want to deal with Israeli-Palestinian case and with the question of decolonization, I think that we need to refer in a very serious way to this sense of belonging, to this sense of attachment. Because, you know, Palestinian sumud, sumud is the, I mean, that people attach to their land is something which I can see on the Israeli Jewish side. And again, I know it is constructed. I know it is new. I knew it is part. I know it is part of the colonial culture, but still, I think that if we want to understand what's going on, if we want to think about a common future to to this territory, I think we need to take it very, very seriously. And uh, unfortunately, many of my colleagues and friends from the left, the radical left in Israel, they say, "Oh, come on, you know." It is all constructed. Yes, we know it is all constructed, but we also know that people, you know, this is the only thing they really care about. Who are they, to what, where they belong? Um, and not just as a property, I'm talking about land, in a, you know, in a deeper sense. So, I, I mean, I mm -hmm. feel that for me, this is a big question. I mean, I don't think that I have the answer, as you can see, but I feel that this is a very, very serious issue. Gracias, Jaime. Gracias, Mauro. Eh, tenemos unos... Eh... Thank you, Jaime. Thanks, Mauro. We have three minutes more, Matthew. We have to close at 6.30, right? In fact, this that Mauro was saying just now, I think we can connect very well with the last uh, visual artist that was talking in the movie that she talks about Oh, sorry, he talks about what it represents to be a, a Palestinian artist in Palestine. And he says that it's an act of perseverance. Yeah. And he expresses this capacity, this ability of resisting in their own territories, the ones that you have always been dispossessed of, and you have been also a victim of violence. So he also says that the Palestinian artists represent a metaphoric message of this social context, right? Of this possession. So we also hear connecting with the first speaker said, Muhammad Kulas. He says that the, the singer boy, he says that the art is a way of resisting mm -hmm. and it allows also something that I quote from your article, Hein. Maybe we can go deeper in this term. The art as a way of resisting, it allows a pedagogy of hope. Please talk about this pedagogy of hope, what is it for you and Michelle 
that you describe in your article and that you, we also saw in this film? I think it's, oh, it's a heavy question for the two minutes that were left. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but no, but I think that I think, I think we, I agree. I think it's a very, very central issue, uh, and I think you know it, it is also linked to the question of how we can decolonize knowledge that we produce as researchers, because this idea came to us through our interviewees, and you know what can we do with our findings in order to create, I would say, uh, the foundations or the infrastructure to develop a sense of hope. So, I mean, I think that, you know, the pedagogies of hope are very much linked, you know, maybe it brings it back to us as researchers. What is our role? What kind of topics we pick to do our research on, okay? And for me, you know, I know what I'm interested in. You know, I'm interested in issues that are close to my heart. Uh, because of many, many reasons. And I think, you know, this is maybe the only, I mean, I, I'll say just an anecdote. Uh, when we started working on this project, we applied to, I will not mention the name of the funder. And they just didn't want to support a project which is so political. And I think it is linked to, 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 to the issue of hope. How can we create hope at least within our community, academic community, uh, we have to do it in order to spread the news uh, to other people, uh, to other communities. So I think that this is, you know, something that we need. I mean, I feel that this is my commitment. I'm not interested in other issues personally. I'm interested to deal with issues that are close to my heart and that I feel that I might be able to contribute something, you know, to even a bit. To, to social or political change. Así es, gracias, Jaime, lo que también nos llevaría. Yeah. This will lead us to another debate where we, for which we don't have time, that yeah. it's... Hazle una pregunta más. No. another question. No, no. Eso me lleva a un... Just wanted to say that this leads me to a debate, something that is really from for my attention, from the academy and our position as academic people, for good or bad. What you said just now, the level of involvement that we should have as social researchers when we are making proposals of research if the research proposal should be uh, or must be part of our lifestyles or our like fights or they shouldn't well i i think that you replied previously to this but i will lead you, you to go deeper into this I'll, I'll be very short, you know, I'm very Foucauldian in that sense. I think, that, <laughs> I think we are all accumulating power throughout our life. Some people accumulate capital, some people accumulate political power, some people accumulate intellectual power, okay? Mm -hmm. And I think the question is, what do we do with it? Mm. I think this is the real political and moral question. What do we do with it? Do we try to make a change? To, you know, to create a transformation or do we enjoy staying in our comfort zone, you know, till we are retiring and, you know, dying happily somewhere. Uh, so I think, you know, the, for me, this is the question. And I think, you know, again, it's a very, I'm from a privileged position as, you know, as a professor in, you know, in an institution in the UK, I can allow myself to say, it, but I hope that the way I worked even before, <laughs> you know, somehow approve my, my, my position. So it's a question of power. We have power. And the question is, what are we doing with it in order to change the, the world we are living in? As you do in this conference, you know, you could pick a very, very nice and maybe more sexy topic to your conference, but you picked a very specific, you know, 
issue to discuss. So I think this is for me a relevant use of your power, your privilege uh, in creating, you know, this kind of conversation. That was a very good answer. Uh, we wanted to say thank you for your for this, David, from our country. We have different situations. As now at a national level, we are trying to debate about this. So it's very coherent, your answer. Jaime, it was a pleasure to hear you. From my position as a student, not an academic, I think it's very important to have that value of research. We're thinking about what we can contribute. Those are dreams for me because I'm a student now, but it nourished me and, and it nourished my culture and lets me see the position of privilege and allows me to meet people from all over the world to get to learn different lifestyles and, and scopes of research and it strengthens me as a student and as a young person where I'm just discovering where I want to go. So I wanted to say thank you very much for your collaboration and for your presentation because it was really interesting. Thank you, Janina, for your words and your point of view about this. Eh, ¿Alguna otra cosa más? Mauro, sí, adelante. Any other thing? <laughs> Mauro. Just wanted to make a last comment. It's beautiful to see this hope pedagogy in Latin America. We have had different experiences through history, and I think this has generated any keeps generating the possibility of opening paths and debating spaces to get out of our comfort zone by doing very little stuff. But this allows us to open debate spaces, uh, to gather, to reflect, and also the it allows the exchange to open these points of view. In that sense, what Janina said makes a lot of sense with the times that we're living. It's, they are really complex in all over the world and they seem little fights and battles, but it's important to recognize them and to recognize that we have this possibility of coexistence. And that's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much for the documental. It was, I feel very grateful. It was unexpected. It was very kind from you to show, to allow us to show this documental in other places there are people that don't want to show the work and don't want to share it. So we're very thankful for you for sharing your work. And I would like you to say that to your friend, Michelle. Of course. Bien, pues, uh, me suma los agradecimientos, well, Jaime. I just wanted to say thank you too. And to finish, I would like to take the Mauro's last words and link them with the visual artist that was speaking about hope and love. He was talking about the walls that were painted with these messages. And he said that these paintings are on the streets, in the neighborhoods, 
those neighborhoods that are nothing because they have been instructed for the ontology, but those paintings have the power of touching all the people that live around. Mm -hmm. How the artist he can link this work art with the people that live there and it allows to create other imaginaries and narratives and here in Chile since two years ago since October 2019 we are trying to create other social imaginaries other narratives of union of love of hope also that go against this speech of this colonial logic, capitalist and patriarchal imaginary of these heroes speeches and they are not real. And we have here this um, hope and love that we saw in the documentary and that I hope that they go and have results that are more positive, that result in a more livable world, to say it like that. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. I think it's time for you to go to sleep, maybe, or <laughs> to go to have dinner. <laughs> Thank you so much. No, no, I'm not that old. <laughs> Yeah, no, th thank you very much. And I really appreciate, you know, the, the, the topics, the, the invitation and the discussion. So thank you very, very much. Our pleasure. Thanks to you. Muchas gracias a todas y a todos. Thank gracias. you, everyone. Thank you, Mauro, Matthew, Janina, the research group, Diego, Dante. Thank you for the broadcasting. Also the interpreters that were helping us in this session. And this seminary continues tomorrow as the last day of it. Talking about decolonizing urban territories. Without further ado, thank you so much. We will see you tomorrow. <laughs>